Today on In Grace, we're in Dallas, Texas, to show you the beautiful ICR Discovery Center. Are you looking for hope? My amazing parents taught me to look for hope in the Lord, and that gave me a passion to explore God's incredible creation. I'm Jim Scudder, Jr. Let's go on an adventure together and find hope in grace. Hey, I'm glad that you're watching In Grace today, and we're in Dallas because here at In Grace, we love creation, and this is a creation museum. I've seen other museums that are all about creation and they're wonderful, but this one is especially great because it is from an organization that started the modern creation movement, Henry Morris, John Morris, and others. And the one that's gonna guide us today has been with this organization for quite a while, Dr. Frank Sherwin. He is a zoologist, I've been wanting to meet him, and today he's gonna show us this awesome Discovery Center at ICR, come along. Well, this is a beautiful museum you guys have here at Institute for Creation Research. And I've known of ICR for many, many years. Uh, when I was young, I knew about Henry Morris, and then John Morris came to our church and Dwayne Gish. And so I know that you've been around a long time with ICR. What's your main thrust? What's your main focus? Well, our main focus, Jim, is simply that in the beginning, God created can be taken as literal truth and we don't have to try and sanitize it or make it some poetical, metaphorical interpretation. And so we step out in faith that in the beginning, God really did create everything. And the Apostle Paul then says in Romans chapter 1 and verse 20 that God's creation is clearly seen. And if God's creation is clearly seen, again, we step out in faith and we look around and we see indeed that God's creation is clearly seen, not only in this physical sciences, the geology and all, but just as importantly, the biological sciences. And so that's what uh, Henry Morris and Dwayne Gish and the others, the great founders of creation science here in the United States believed, and they passed on to others. And I was so privileged and honored to be asked to be part of ICR. And this is a beautiful facility that you have here. You have these fossils, the dinosaurs. A biblicist would understand that this is all young, relatively speaking, young compared to the main paradigm that we've been here for millions of years. Mm -hmm. So the biblical explanation is portrayed right here on your wall right. in these beautiful paintings. You have yeah. the days of creation. We believe that God created man and woman. He created us in his image and that we just have to take that and go with it, that uh, it, there is male and then there's female, and that uh, we understand that from the Word of God, and, and God was there in the beginning, and He told us what happened. Well, listen, this is a beautiful lobby, but I want to see the exhibits. Okay, let's go. The Hall of History? Hall of History, indeed. Okay. From 2500 BC to about 1200 AD. What huh. we see here is on the various uh, pictures, drawings, and paintings is the history of the world. Hmm. Uh, it, not only the Western history, but uh, throughout the Far East and the Middle East as well. And they tell an incredible story. Yeah, and if you're gonna use your Bible as a guide, because we weren't there, mm -hmm. you know, it actually gives us history. It's real, literal history, and it's accurate. So. We would start at the Garden of Eden, and then from there comes all of the history of the world. Exactly, Jim. What we find is that there's 50 chapters in the book of Genesis. Now, the hotly contested first 11 chapters of Genesis, we take by faith. But in Genesis chapter 12 through Genesis chapter 50, with every turn of the archaeologist's shovel, we find that history has been verified. Mm -hmm. Cities, towns, villages, people throughout these chapters in Genesis can be documented in the historical narrative. I see some very brilliant people in this room, mm -hmm. especially this one right here in the yeah. middle, Henry Morris. That's our founder, Henry Morris. Uh, he was a hydrologist, and so who better to write a book on the Genesis Flood than a hydrologist? 
And so Henry Morris just did a phenomenal job. He went to be with the Lord in 2006. Uh, I was very privileged and honored to be able to pray with him in the morning devotions for years at ICR. And he is credited to be the one that really inspired the modern creation movement here in the United States because that book really opened people's minds. You know, the world was starting to think, you know, slow processes over time, uh, but that book gave answers, scientific answers, to explain these things biblically. Exactly. People will criticize Christians and people that believe the Bible, especially a literal interpretation of Genesis, mm -hmm. and say, you cannot be scientific and be a creationist. Um, how would you respond to that? Well, I would simply, first of all, take him to the great Bible-believing scientists of the past, mm -hmm. and then simply ask the question, why not? Why can I not believe that in the beginning God and also do my research as a parasitologist, for example, an invertebrate zoologist and, and do the investigation and the research, study the various systems of a parasite and all, how is that somehow going to make me less knowledgeable uh, in, in simply believing that God created these creatures uh, thousands of years ago? And of course, that's what we're finding with uh, various discoveries. And it, it boggles the mind when you start to really study the beauty and the symmetry and the perfection of creation, it is really foolish for us to say, uh, this museum came out of a tornado and here it is, all these lights, all these beautiful yeah. pictures. No one would accept that. Right. But somehow we accept that we came about by chance. Yeah. Brilliant scientists of really almost every major field of science mm -hmm. uh, were, were Biblicists, or at least they had a biblical worldview on stuff. Yes. And I, I really love the way that you've uh, portrayed that here. Yes, and Isaac Newton was probably the greatest, mm -hmm. and he wrote approximately twice as much on his Christian faith than he did about the science that he did. Mm -hmm. So he's exhibit A for an individual doing science and believing God's Word. Amen. This looks like the Garden of Eden. Yeah, Garden of Eden. And what we find are uh, potpourri of animals, including the birds and uh, dinosaurs, uh, mammals, and we're really not too sure what specific animals were in the Garden of Eden because scripture isn't real clear about that and what kind of plants. We know it was a, a very beautiful place prior to the fall. And so we in our, our sinful condition can only approximate, can only guess as to what the Garden of Eden was like. But we, we feel that it had representative animals and all and, and it must have been incredible. <laughs> this would be a, a huge difference though between the, the prevailing worldview that we evolved and the biblical worldview that God created us. Because you would have man and dinosaurs, for instance, living yeah. at the same time. That's it. Well, Jim, if they were uh, created on the same day, day six, then obviously they lived may maybe not in the exact same environment. They might have been separated a little bit due to ecological reasons, but they were created on the same day and therefore they lived at the same time. Now, this is anathema to the evolutionists. They just can't stand hearing that until a very interesting discovery about 22, 25 years ago when they started finding soft dinosaur tissue. Mm. And that is absolutely amazing to find collagenous fibers within the dinosaur bone that you can stretch using a pair of forceps. I mean, what's that doing sitting there for 66 million years according to the evolutionary timetable? And there's no way that that type of soft tissue can survive that long. And so there is some compelling scientific evidence, but of course we put the Word of God above the scientific evidence and say if the Bible says that man and dinosaur were created together, that's, that's good enough for us. Did you know that dinosaur fossils destroy evolution? 
I would love to send you this exciting video adventure called Dinosaurs That Destroy Evolution when you send a gift of any amount to Ingrace. If your gift is $35 or more, let me send you two more powerful videos, Origins, Creation or Evolution, and Irrefutable Creation Evidence. Destroy evolution and defend creation when you get this incredible video for your gift to Ingrace. If your gift is $35 or more, we will also include the spectacular series, Origins, Creation or Evolution, and Irrefutable Creation Evidence. Call 800-78-GRACE or go to ingrace.tv for more information. Everything was created perfect and right. We're in the Garden of Eden, but then something happened. Something happened that would eventually lead to this global catastrophe by water. The Bible says it's the flood of Noah's day. We're standing here by a um, kind of spooky looking <laughs> creature. Uh, it looks like something Hollywood might have you know, made a movie about. But let's talk about that. Talk about original sin and what happened in the Garden of Eden that one terrible day. Well, we find that Satan, of course, his fall was pride. He, he, just, he had eye trouble and said, I will be like the Most High. And Satan hates whatever God has created. That's, that's a rule of thumb. Whatever God created, Satan hates and wants to destroy. And so this is certainly carried on in the Garden of Eden here, where we find that Satan wants to destroy what God has created. And therefore, he beguiled Eve and, and Adam and Eve fell eating the forbidden fruit. And of course, we're not sure what that is. Scripture doesn't say. Well, that's what I came here to find out. I mean, I'm, I'm seeing it right here. There's a low hanging forbidden fruit. <laughs> yeah, that's it. But you, you say it's not an apple, right? No, it's not an apple. Because that's um, what everyone thinks. Yeah, that's it. And so that's why we painted them uh, gold here. <laughs> But um, whatever the forbidden fruit was, you know, they partook, and so sin entered the world. And later on, through the generations, we find that Scripture teaches in the early chapters of Genesis that the world was filled with violence. Now that phrase is used several times, and so we have to understand the world was filled with violence, and so God brought a flood, and uh, that was His judgment. I love walking and talking. You know, it's it's it, that's what happened in the Garden of Eden, right? Mm -hmm. uh, man had this, this sweet fellowship with the Creator. They were able to walk in the cool of the day and fellowship. And that's why God created us, mm -hmm. for His glory, exactly. for us to enjoy Him and what He created. And hopefully people can find that, you know, through faith in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Okay, so these. These are called Ankylosaurus, and I like to call them a walking tank. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> and Amazing. they were just very formidable creatures. And as an Ankylosaurus, we look to the fossil record and find that Ankylosaurus have always been Ankylosaurus. We don't find any relatives, evolutionary building up to an Ankylosaurus. And so that's the thing about the, the fossil record, especially, uh, Jim, when it comes to dinosaurs. We like to say at ICR, dinosaurs have always been dinosaurs. I have a two-hour presentation just on dinosaurs, and I have at least a half a dozen quotes by leading evolutionists in the field where they are intellectually honest, and I salute them because they are honest. They, they admit that they don't know where the dinosaurs came from, evolutionarily speaking. You just take your shovel, dig down, there they are, dinosaurs. These are impressive. Yeah. These are impressive. You also had taught about what a feather is and how intricate just a feather is. How many times have we stopped to appreciate God's genius for just creating a, a, the feather of a bird? And this is a problem where evolution is saying that uh, dinosaurs or a scaly reptilian creature became a bird. Uh, there is a vast, vast amount of anatomical or morphological difference between a scale of a reptile and the feather of a bird. You're talking about two completely different structures. Mm. A scale is a scale, but that's all it is. Now, a feather has microscopic structures called barbs and barbules, and you can see the bird as it zippers them up and unzippers the feather as they preen. Well, it turns out preening is, is so important for the bird. Well, the bird's life depends wow. on preening to keep those feathers clear. And so what does a bird have? What did God design the bird to have to preen the feathers? And that is a bill, a very unique structure, the bill that can preen the feathers. Now, if dinosaurs had feathers, true feathers, 
Dinosaurs did not have the mouth part to preen those feathers. Within just days to weeks, those feathers, quote unquote, of the dinosaurs just would have been a mess, just a mash of material, and, and it would have, would come to nothing. And so that's why this idea of feathered dinosaurs is, is suspect. <laughs> So you have this beautiful creation and everything's good. And then we have sin. We have mankind's original sin and that sin has been passed down by our ancestor, Adam. Thank you, Adam. Uh, but if he, if he hadn't, I would have, I'm sure. So then you have this, this major episode in the Bible in Genesis and it talks about the world full of violence and God destroying the world uh, with a global flood. So here I see you have a beautiful ark model and you have an exhibit that talks about the ark. Right. So describe what that world would have been like in Noah's day and only Noah and his family aboarded this, this vessel that could have saved so many others. Right, what we find in scripture is very, very clear that the world was filled with violence. God told righteous Noah to build an ark. It took Noah and his family and probably Noah's friends, maybe, to build an ark and it took them a century to build the ark. And they lived that long and I'm sure that Mr. Noah was witnessing to those people faithfully, judgment is coming, be ready. Yeah, my God is a loving God, Noah. I don't believe he'd do anything like that. And we hear a lot about that, a lot about that today. But God did send a flood. And one of the things that's mentioned in scripture is that the fountains of the great deep burst forth. Mm -hmm. Now that's mentioned first. That implies some kind of tectonic activity mm -hmm. where you had a, a renting of the surface of the earth and releasing trillions of gallons of water from the underneath. And then of course, it says in scripture, the, the windows of heaven were opened and you have the 40 days and 40 nights of rain. Now for the actual flood itself, that existed a little bit over a year mm. and it was about 4,500 years ago. So if you put what scripture says together with what we can identify and research in the uh, material that we find on the earth today, what we find is something like this that Dr. Timothy Clary, a PhD geologist has put together in looking at the days of the Genesis flood mm. and he puts it on a scale model of the earth. So you would have had a much different earth at that time. Right. And, and some people say, well, how could the water have flooded the whole earth? You know, is there enough water? Yeah. Of course we know the oceans are very, very, very deep. There is enough water. And, yeah. and the, also the mountains weren't as high exactly. uh, in the pre-flood yeah. world. So you have those two factors, fountains of the great deep, superheated water mm -hmm. uh, coming up, it totally changing our climate, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. for, for a long time. You know, the ice age probably is a result of all of that too. Yeah. So that all fits with what the Bible describes perfectly. To a T. Mm. The earth is 72% uh, water on the surface. The average depth of the ocean is two and a half miles. Now that's the average depth. So when these critics say there's not enough water, I'm going, you gotta be kidding. <laughs> there's yeah. plenty yeah. of water. Uh, if you want to look at a planet that doesn't have any water on the surface, look at Mars. Ironically, it's the secular astronomers that look at Mars and say, wow, it looks like a lot of flooding in the past. <laughs> yeah. But they're looking at this planet, 72% water on the surface and going, I don't see any effects of a flood. <laughs> they don't want to see it. Yeah. Here's the beautiful model of the Ark and you have different you know, levels. Of course, we know it was three levels. Um, some people wonder how could that be possibly big enough? Well, the first thing is it's a lot bigger than people realize. It was the size of a World War II escort aircraft carrier. So mm -hmm. that was pretty big. And uh, the average size, it's hard to say what the average size animal was. Some say average size of a sheep, maybe a little bit larger. But the fact is that the animals went on board the ark. They were able to live on the ark. And there was also extra room for those that perhaps uh, did repent and want to come on board. There was room for them. And then um, you have the doorway here and it says, uh, John 10, 9, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. Those are the words of Jesus. Yes. And so I personally, Jim, and I won't be able to prove it this side of heaven, <laughs> but I think he was alluding to the ark. Hmm and that they had a one door to the ark. What a graphic example of period of judgment, a period of safety and refuge. Mm. And Jesus is the door. Mm. When he says, I am the way. Yes, yes.
Creation shouts a creator. And the beautiful thing is he didn't just create us and let us go. He created us, we sinned, we rebelled, we messed up, and he came with a rescue plan. He knew what was gonna happen, but he did it to showcase his love. He did it to share with the world how much he loves us. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him, trusts in him, should not perish, which is hell, but have everlasting life, which is heaven. So many people say, Pastor Scudder, that's way too easy. I have to do something. The problem with that is we have nothing to offer God. We are penniless, we are broke, we are poor. He couldn't charge us anything. We couldn't do anything to earn our eternal life because we have nothing. Therefore, in his great love and his great grace, he did it all. He sent his son, Jesus, to die on the cross. He shed his blood, he rose again. And he says, if you will trust in me, believe in me, not religion, but in me, you will not perish, but have everlasting life. My friend, today, is the day of salvation. Put your trust in Jesus today and you will be saved today, tomorrow, and forever. Did you know that dinosaur fossils destroy evolution? I would love to send you this exciting video adventure called Dinosaurs That Destroy Evolution when you send a gift of any amount to In Grace. If your gift is $35 or more, let me send you two more powerful videos, Origins, Creation or Evolution, and Irrefutable Creation Evidence. Destroy evolution and defend creation when you get this incredible video for your gift to In Grace. If your gift is $35 or more, we will also include the spectacular series, Origins, Creation or Evolution, and Irrefutable Creation Evidence. Call 800-78-GRACE or go to ingrace.tv for more information. Tune in next week for part two of Origins, Creation versus Evolution. Is ICR's mission to just get people to stop believing in evolution? Or is the mission to introduce them to the one true God, the Creator? Well, I think the latter is, is more correct. We openly challenge in a diplomatic way the evolutionary paradigm that talks about molecules to man, fish to philosopher, particles to people. Record every single In Grace episode. You will be so blessed as we learn all about God's world and God's Word. In Grace is a viewer-supported ministry. Thank you for your prayers and gifts.